Hi, I'm Mike, this is TYT Science, and today we're doing debunking NLP. And I'm doing this because there's a paper just out by Professor Richard Wiseman um, that essentially, I believe, is the last nail in the coffin of the scientific validity of NLP. Specifically, the paper deals with eye accessing cues and their utility as a lie detection mechanism. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a brief history of NLP, the, the major claims and theories behind it, the scientific backing to that, or rather the absence of it, and then a few thoughts and reflections. NLP, or Neuro Linguistic Programming, uh, was started in the 1970s by Richard Bandler and John Grinder. The general story goes that Richard Bandler was a psychology student listening to some therapy tapes of the great masters and he thought that he had discovered um, key linguistic patterns that they were all using that made their therapy effective. He then approached John Grinder who by then had got his PhD and was lecturing in linguistics and together they formed NLP, their first book, two-part book called The Structure of Magic, one and two, came out in 1975, and from then on they were quite successful. So whereas they started out, and at the time there were a whole bunch of what's called power therapies, um, basically challenging the old Freudian model of just let them talk for ages and ages, which they believed was ineffective and too slow, there are a bunch of these power therapies making big claims about how they could interact with the patient, get in quick, change their, their world views and their models and, and deliver good fast therapy and of course this had a lot of appeal. NLP did particularly well out of these new models because it very soon um, abandoned um, all of the therapy and and went more into self-help um, modeling excellence and particularly went into the business world and by the early 1980s the two men were making quite a packet of money. Right, so let's get straight to the claims of um, NLP as originally set out um, and then we'll look at the scientific validation of that and then we'll look at how it stands in the world today. So NLP starts with these kind of assumptions. One, the map is not the territory, meaning specifically that your mental ideas about the world are not actually as the world is. You will have generalizations, you will have oversights, deletions, whatever. Okay. Principle two, um, we all have um, sensory modalities, visual, auditory, gustatory, olfactory, kinesthetic, um, but importantly we can have uh, preferred representational systems, i.e. you can be a visual person or you can be an auditory person. You may like your information in pictures or you may like listening to it. And importantly, that also comes out in your language. So visual people will tend to say, I see what you're saying, and auditory people will tend to say, I hear what you're saying, and kinesthetic people will tend to say, I feel you. Okay? Now, third point is that they observed that people in good rapport who get on well tend to have the same body language or tend to adopt rather the same body language, uh, the same tone of speaking, same words, so forth and so on. Now they took these things and bundled it into therapy in the following way. One, establish rapport with the client. Two, um, address their issues. Three, um, decide on what they want for outcomes and plan those outcomes. Now in terms of the establishing rapport, they went straight to this thing of um, people in good rapport tend to have similar body postures and, and tone and so forth, and they said that you should mirror, pace, lead. So first of all, mirror what they are doing in order to establish rapport. You copy their body language, you copy their tone, their speed of speaking, and also the modality by which they communicate. So if they're saying, I see, I visual this, visual that, you say, yes, it looks to me like you're on the right path and this kind of stuff. And if they're going auditory, again, you use words that fit that modality. 
Now, secondly, when you get into the second phase and you're dealing with the actual problem at hand, you address their specific fears to, to clarify their map. So if they say, you know, I'm afraid, specifically, what are you afraid of? I don't like this person. Specifically, what about this person do you not like? When do the problems come up? Now, you and I could call that just clarification, but in NLP terminology, you are moving from surface structure to deep structure. And this is the meta model, and you are using meta questions. That, the words they use. Okay. And then finally, when you have addressed all the inconsistencies, you agree with the patient in, in outcome, and um, you, you plan how it's going to be, and you try and imagine yourself in that scenario. Okay, scientific criticisms um, were first off on this um, preferred representational system. It was found to just not be of any particular use. Not, not really there, not of any use. In fact, it was found uh, in the 1980s that NLP as a therapy itself was just not effective. And there were some academics who were uh, NLP therapists who were saying, oh no, you, you can't actually evaluate it scientifically, only phenomenologically. And so this is one of the reasons why they decided to leave the academic area very fast and go into pop and go into business because, hey, they were making money there and people weren't challenging them. They were just lapping it up. Now, uh, there was one thing associated with um, the visual, um, auditory, kinesthetic, VAK system um, that has been a claim that has been peddled for a long time and, and not been challenged, and that was the eye accessing cues. So, along with the sensory modality, when you evoke that in someone, that tends to get reflected in their eyes. Um, if you visualize something, you tend to look up, um, if you're thinking about tone of voice or, or, or remembering something spoken, you tend to look to the side. And if you're thinking about feelings, then you tend to look down. But this was split into two halves. So classically on the left hand side, this is visual remembered. This is auditory remembered. And this is auditory internal. Um, your own internal dialogue later it became auditory digital. Um, pure logic, this kind of stuff. Then on the other side, you have visual constructed, auditory constructed, and then kinesthetic, all about feelings, real physical feelings, but also emotions. Now, importantly, they made the claim that there's a difference between visual remembered and visual constructed, and this can be used for lie detection. If you ask someone to recall an event, if they're being truthful, they will simply remember it. If they are being untruthful, then they will have to construct it. And this claim that has gone down the decades now has finally been picked up and looked at authoritatively by Professor Richard Wiseman and found that basically no. No, he, there's, there's absolutely nothing there. You get you set up a scenario where some people are told to lie, other people are told to tell the truth. You do this from each and every angle, nothing there. So that's why I believe this is a, a good final nail in the coffin of the, the claims that were made by NLP. Just because it's a nice sounding system does not make it true. Okay, just some final thoughts. Obviously, NLP is alive and well today, uh, regardless of what science may think of it. It is very integrated into a lot of business thought, and Richard Bandler and John Grinder are still busy doing what they do, and they have plenty of audience for their ideas. And I personally have no objection whatsoever to the pursuit of excellence and self-development and self-transformation. Um, however, if claims are made, I, as a scientist, like most other scientists, want to see those claims tested, and if they cannot be validated, then they shouldn't be peddled anymore, quite simply. Additionally, there's a criticism that many have that I share, that the name neuro-linguistic programming is somewhat misleading. It gives the impression of a very hard science, whereas in fact, 
um, it is not. Um, and then finally, um, something that I object to slightly as a style of communication between people is this mirror, pace, lead. Um, and also, as it gets incorporated into business and taken into the science of persuasion and the science of influence, dear God, when some people think that they actually have tools to influence other people, and this can be done very mechanically, I object to that. Um, I, I don't like that. Um, and I think quite sensibly, the best way to have actually someone listen to what you want to communicate to them is to listen to them, to tell what they want, what they're about, and what their ideas are. And once you do that for someone, they're much more likely to be open-hearted with you, just as you have been to them. Um, and certainly, should anyone approach me with the attitude that they can mirror my gestures, mirror my tone, and then drop a few anchors and commands on me to bend my opinion to their thinking, well, I think that they would find out relatively quickly that their map ain't my territory.